I'm going to talk to you this morning about optics that I think every one of you can relate to. And if you can't, you should start relating to it right now. The, uh, the thing is, is that when you go out around the world, and this is probably already happening to a certain degree, when you go out and talk to friends or colleagues or your mother or your whoever, your grandmother, eventually you're going to be asked a question. And that question is going to be something like, so I saw a rainbow the other day. How come the colors are the opposite direction? Or maybe they won't even notice that. Maybe they'll just say, how come the sky is blue? Or how come the rainbow is the color it is? And you know, people ask these questions all the time and they expect you as people trained in optics to be able to answer those questions. And so even though you, I don't think any of you are specializing in my field of optical remote sensing or atmospheric optics, that's okay. You still need to understand some basics. And so that's what I'm here for, is to try to teach you some of those basics. And it's also just really fun to be able to walk out the door after a long day in the lab and look up at the sky and see something optical and understand at least a little bit about what you're seeing. So that's the objective today. Okay, so I guess, do we only have one screen? It doesn't really matter to me, but I, if I have both screens, I might spend part of my time standing here. Otherwise, I'll try to stand over there when I'm out of the way. Is it coming up? Right. Yeah. Either way will work for me. We don't teach in these classrooms, so we don't know how to get things to work fully. Let's see if that works. Okay, well, I was thinking that the Brazilians would still be on the line, and so I was going to celebrate with them the fact that we are covering this huge range of geography, but they're too busy on the beach, and so we'll just, uh, <laughs> we'll just celebrate without them. But I, I came from this yellow dot right there, Bozeman, Montana, in the United States, and that's at about 46 degrees north latitude. We are presently here in Tucson, southern Arizona, in the United States, at about 32 degrees north latitude. And the group that we just saw were on the beach down here at about eight degrees south latitude. So they're on the other side, long way away from us. So if, it would be nice if they were joining us here, but that's okay. Okay, can we bring these front lights down, Paula? <laughs> what I want is the lights that are on the screen. Oh, that, that one's lit. <laughs> okay, now if it's this dark, you have to promise me no snoozing, okay? <laughs> my, my goal is to have the colors a little bit vibrant on the screen, but still have you not totally asleep. So. Okay, I think we got it on both screens for you now. Okay. Does it work out for you guys if I stand here part of the time? Okay. Because it's probably easier for me with the computer being right here. Especially you students from the southwestern United States universities, you see a lot of really dramatic sunsets. Uh, that's one thing that's really special about the southwest is, is the sunsets. Montana doesn't do too badly either. This is a Montana sunset. When I was a student here at the University of Arizona, I was used to seeing great sunsets, and I have many, many pictures to prove it, just like the Facebook page says. <laughs> um, I was also used to seeing dramatic storm clouds. This is, again, a Montana picture, but, but typical of the kind of storms that you might see around different places. Actually, great storm clouds are to be seen everywhere. One of the most dramatic ones I've ever seen was in Washington, D.C., actually. And uh, what's, what's the basic cause of those colors versus those colors. Okay, does anybody know the answer? Scattering. It's scattering, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, let me go here and talk about, uh, I only have, if I remember right, three really techno geek slides, and this is one of them. <laughs> so you have to pay attention here a little bit. On this slide, th what this is is a, a calculation from what's called a me scattering code. So this is an electromagnetic scattering program that calculates scat electromagnetic scattering or optical scattering from a sphere. In this case, spherical particles of something. And in this case, that something is 
typically little water droplets. And so we have the normalized irradiance or intensity on the vertical axis and uh, wavelength. I think my green laser is starting to die, so I'll use your red one. And wavelength is on the horizontal axis. What this is showing you is that the blue curve is calculated for a little tiny particle, which is many, many times smaller than the wavelength. Okay, that's the condition for which the Rayleigh scattering approximation holds, which is a dipole scattering model. And for that, the wavelength distribution of scattering is, it, it goes as one over wavelength to the fourth power. So think about one over wavelength to the fourth. Okay, anything to the fourth power is a fast variation with whatever that thing is, right? If you had, if you have a function that goes as t squared, where t is time, obviously it's growing with time very rapidly. Well, think about wavelengths to the fourth power. It's increasing with wavelength, but that's in the denominator. So if you have a number that's getting large and you put it in the denominator, you get something that's getting small very rapidly. And that's what we have here. One over wavelengths to the fourth, which means that short wavelength light is scattered much more effectively than long wavelength light. And so you see 400 nanometers, this is sort of approximately the visible spectrum that we see with our eyes. So 400 nanometers would be down in the deep blue, the violet region. And we, we get a lot more scattering than out here in the red. A factor of, actually if you do the, the math and calculate it, you can come up with about a factor of eight. The red curve is a little bit disturbing because it actually goes the opposite direction from what I expected, but it's, it's basically flat, is my point that I want to make. This is for a 10 micron water droplet, which is not in the Rayleigh scattering regime for visible light. That's in the Mie scattering domain, which means that it's comparable to, or slightly larger in this case, than the, than the wavelength of light. So we have to use a full electromagnetic solution. We can't use simple Rayleigh scattering theory. And so this would be typical <laughs> of a cloud droplet. Little water droplets that make up many clouds are about that size. And so when we go back to this picture and say, why does this cloud appear nominally white? Well, the explanation is right there, what we talked about. Why is the sky blue back here? Well, the things that are scattering light back here in the blue part of the sky are the molecules of gas that make up the atmosphere themselves. What molecules are those? What, what molecules are in the atmosphere? Do you guys know? Nitrogen, oxygen. You guys know all these things, right? So I guess I'm done. <laughs> okay, so it's nitrogen and oxygen primarily. And those are many, many times smaller than the wavelength, so we get a blue kind of scattering. Whereas the cloud droplets are more like the 10 micron water droplets that I just showed you the calculation for. And so it, it, there, the calculation I showed you was a little unrealistic because it's just for a narrow distribution, but it showed that essentially it was flat. It, it actually even rose slightly. Most large particle scattering will fall off with wavelength, but slowly, much more slowly than Rayleigh scattering. Okay, but that, that leaves us with a mystery. And the mystery is then, when you look at the sky, what do you see? According to what I just said, it should be violet, because the violet light scatters much more than the red light or even the blue light. So why do we see blue instead of violet? Or do you see violet? I don't. <laughs> I see blue when I look at the sky, during, during the day at least. I see blue. So why is it not violet? Well, the answer is a couple things. First of all, this is a spectrum of, of scattered radiance. So this is the, the amount of uh, power per area per solid angle that's, that's scattered by the molecules in the sky versus wavelength again. This is over a wider spectral range than we talked about before. Now I'm going from 0.3 to 1 micron. And so we are seeing that there's this curve that is dominated by the emission spectrum of the sun, which looks a lot like about a 6,000 Kelvin black body, which peaks at about 550 nanometers in, in the wavelength domain. And so that would be right in here. But what you see is the scattering peaks over here, which is at a shorter wavelength in the solar spectrum, and then it falls off precipitously. And so there's something, there's a lot more going on than what we've talked about so far. First of all, the one thing that's going on that enhances the blue relative to the 550 is the scattering. That's the Rayleigh scattering effect. But why does it fall off here? Rayleigh scattering doesn't predict that. 
right? It yeah. predicts just the opposite. It predicts that it would keep going. And so who said that? Absorption? It's absorption. And it's primarily ozone. So there's a layer of ozone in our, what I call the upper atmosphere. The upper atmospheric people call that the middle atmosphere. But in the stratosphere, there's a layer of, of ozone that absorbs a lot of the short wavelength, high energy uh, radiation that would otherwise give us all skin cancer. And so it does us a favor. And so you, you've all heard things about the ozone hole and the ozone layer. That's, that's what's causing this precipitous fall off to zero. So if you actually went on a rocket outside of those layers of the atmosphere, if you went up to about 50 or 60 kilometers, you would actually be able to get to a point where that fall off no longer happens because you'd be outside of the ozone layer. Okay, there's one other thing. So we, we, this would say, okay, we see fairly blue sky, but there's another effect, and this is hand-drawn with kind of a crappy little mouse kind of thing. So it's not, it's not to be taken quantitatively. This is just sort of a qualitative picture. But look at what this says. This, this is the photopic response curve of human vision. In other words, the daytime vision curve. This is what you see when your eyes are light adapted, nominally, kind of my approximation. And it, it, it peaks at about 550 nanometers, 555 actually nanometers, and it falls off to zero by about 380 nanometers and near 700 nanometers. And so the combination, what, what you see is a combination of what the scattering presents and what your eye can detect. And so when you multiply by the sensitivity curve of your eye, you get a blue sky instead of a violet sky. So it's really the two things. It's a, it's a combination of Rayleigh scattering, so it's three things. Rayleigh scattering, ozone absorption, and your visual system spectral response curve. So when, when your kids someday ask you, Daddy or Mommy, why is the sky blue? You know, that's the classic question kids are supposed to ask, right? Usually they ask much harder questions, but <laughs> they might ask that question, and now you know. And, and maybe you knew already, but that's, that's, a, that's a good starting point. All right, so now here's a picture that I took not too far from my house of a full moon rising one night. And you see some similar effects to what we talked about. Oh, actually, I want to go back a couple slides because I want to revisit this in, in the light of what we just talked about. <clears throat> when we talk about Rayleigh scattering creating blue light for the sky, that same process produces the red light that lights up the clouds at sunset. So the argument that we just talked about of clouds being spectrally flat, or fairly spectrally flat, means that you can think of clouds as the palette upon which Mother Nature paints. So whatever colors are in the sky sort of are just reflected to your eye with pretty much their true spectral nature by these clouds. And so that's, that's something that's really, I think, cool about clouds. A sunset without clouds is actually quite boring. It's just sort of there. It's, it, it, it's actually pretty exciting when you look at the twilight colors, but that's a whole other topic. But to get these really dramatic red kind of sunsets, you have to have something other than just the atmosphere. You have to, have put, you have to either put something into the atmosphere or you have to have clouds. And so what's going on here? This sunlight is coming in which we'll call for the moment white light. It's good enough, we'll, we'll, we'll call it that for now. So we have white light coming in, and it, it skims through the atmosphere. And in this case, it's coming through a very long atmospheric path, right? Because the sun has, actually in this picture, the sun has already set. But if the sun is setting, then the light is coming through a long atmospheric path to where you see it. And along the way, it's scattering out blue light to create the blue sky for other people. By the time it gets to you, way over here, it shines on these clouds and all the blue light is gone. And so all the light that's left is, is the long wavelength light, which is predominantly red. So that red light is what's painting these clouds red and the, the clouds themselves scatter with a fairly spectrally flat spectrum and so you, you see the red light. 